Good evening. Uh, we gather at the foot of the cross this last Wednesday night of March and this fifth Wednesday night of Lent. How do I know it's the fifth Wednesday night? Because it's the fifth word of Jesus' seven last words from the cross. So we're on the fifth word tonight. And our guest preacher this evening is Pastor Carl Yost. Pastor Carl has preached here at St. Mark's before. But Pastor Carl grew up in Salisbury, North Carolina and uh, went around as a pastor's kid for a while, kind of like me. In fact, for a while, he grew up in Hickory, North Carolina, and the home that he grew up in was less than two blocks away from the house that my wife and family and I moved from uh, six years ago when we moved to Mooresville. So we, once upon a time, we kind of sort of lived in the ne same neighborhood, just not in the same decade. Uh, so uh, if he looks a little bit like a pilgrim tonight when he stands up, it's because Pastor Carl did serve Pilgrim Lutheran Church once upon a time. There is such a place in Lexington, South Carolina. Uh, and uh, anyway, we're glad to have Pastor Carl with us this night. There's a little bit more information about Pastor Carl on the back of your bulletins. So we welcome him to proclaim uh, the last or this fifth word of Jesus tonight, specifically, uh, I thirst. Let's now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please stand as you're able. The Lord be with you. We are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ to remember his last words at his passion and death on the cross. Merciful God, your son was lifted up on the cross to draw all people to himself. Grant that we who have been born out of his wounded side may at all times find mercy in him. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Say, come unto me and rest. Lay 
Holy Gospel according to John, the 19th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which is in Hebrew called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written, put on the cross, it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, where his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother and disciples whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, In order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received this wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise it's an honor to be here with Dave and Vern. Uh, I've been retired now for several years, and I miss the Wednesday night services oftentimes during Lent because of uh, just, I like the psalm that says, from the beginning of the sunrise to the sunset, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And when Lent comes around and the evening services where people gather uh, to study the important passion of Christ, it's just a special time of year as we journey towards the Easter message. And it's a joy to be with you. I can say, though, it's also a joy to sit in the pew and be fed yourself sometime <laughs> as well. But tonight we're looking at the term that Jesus proclaims here, this fifth word, I thirst. Thirst. It's a human need. It's defined as bodily condition, a desire when your mouth or throat gets dry. It can also be seen as a sense of craving something, thirsting for something. You know, we thirst in many ways. We'll finish a task out in the yard, the heat gets to us, we get dehydrated and might cry out for something to drink. But then sometimes, like in today's world, when we see what all is going on, we'll thirst not just for something to drink, but we'll thirst for peace and justice and harmony, equality and fairness. But here when Jesus cries out on the cross, it's purely a physical symptom, a physical cry. I remember one time, in a nursing home where I was with an elderly gentleman. He was on his last bed and he was, had congestive heart failure and the last thing he was said was, um, I said, can I do you anything for you? He said, water, water. And I didn't think about it at the time, but you know, this is like Jesus' last words himself. And back then, though, you know, if you're on, like, hospice, you can't give people liquids because it's hard on the body when it dies to have all that liquid in you, that's fluids. So all you could do is just take a little um, 
sponge-like thing and rub in their mouth to give them some relief. You know, this is what Jesus is uh, going through in a sense. He's hanging on the cross exhausted. He's the suffering servant. He's fulfilled the work of redemption. He's dealt with the filth of our sin. He's taken on the burden of our guilt. And according to St. John, he hangs on the cross, not as a victim, but one who's completing his mission. It's interesting how a couple times there in the Gospel of John it says, he does this, fulfill the scriptures. You know, even on the cross, Jesus is teaching and fulfilling the scriptures. He says, all things are now accomplished. His body's drained, he's dehydrated, his life work is done. At thirst, I thirst. At first, this might seem like a kind of an out of place word on the cross. When we consider all the other words that we talk about during the seven last words of Jesus every Good Friday or every Holy Week, Lent. These are last words of the cross. You know, the first one is, Father, forgive them. That's a good theological emphasis of reconciliation. The next one is, today you will be with me in paradise. As he talks to the thief, a sense of decisive judgment, a promise of paradise for this penitent one. Then the third word is, behold your mother, as we just read. Compassion, concern for someone, reflecting not just in his mother, for all those who are in need. Then last week, why have you forsaken me? This mystery of the division of God abandoning his son. How does this physical condition simply of I thirst become one of the final words? You know, we're suddenly dropped from the heights of all the theology and holiness and mystery to this physical condition. What does it mean from the cross? Well, one thing it reveals is that this is a human condition. It's like a child crying out in the middle of the night for a drink of water or a teenager coming home after a practice going to the refrigerator to grab a sports drink, thirsting like a worker taking a break on a hot day. Thirst is a human need, a human word. And if this word says anything to us, it is that this man on the cross is human. This son of God, Jesus, is human. A true man suffering, bleeding, thirsty in his dying moments. No halo, no supernatural aura. It's not the heresy of, well, Jesus was really a godlike man and then God left him on the cross, one of the early heresies, or he just appeared to be a man, but he was really something different. No, this is Jesus, the human Son of God who bleeds and dies. And this scene particularly proclaims that his mission is now complete. God was to be human, an obedient son unto death. God incarnate, as we celebrate every Christmas, Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh, and here, Jesus dying on the cross represents all humanity. And I thirst is not just a human condition. It's a humiliating condition. This isn't a prayer that Jesus is saying from the cross, but it's a plea for those who crucify him to help relieve him of his thirst. He begs for a drink. Helpless. He has to rely on others. How often times in my ministry, and I know Dave and Vern's ministry, when you see somebody who has always served others 
and all of a sudden they found themselves in a place where they're having to let everybody else wait on them and how hard that is for them. Here Jesus, who was the servant of all, now can't even serve himself. And there's a certain irony here according to Scripture because he's the one who changed water into wine. He's the one who at Jacob's well offered the Samaritan woman the water of eternal life. He's the one who told his disciples they'll have rivers of living water. Yet here on the cross, enduring, suffering, insults, mockery, he could not even give himself a drink. You see, God not only humbles himself as a human, he humbles himself in love. That Greek word agape love, meaning self-giving, self-sacrificing love. This is how much our God loves us. Also, this fifth word, our thirst, I'm reminded of the words of uh, Professor, the late Dr. Richard Carl Hofler of Southern Seminary, who probably taught your father how to preach as well. He says this word is also a haunting word. And that might sound strange, haunting. But it's not haunting in the sense that we think of ghost stories and spooky stories and such like that. Haunting in the positive sense literally means pervading, being present, invasive, invading, occupying. God invades our humanity with this thirst, this desire. God moves in on us, not just to visit us for a few short years. He comes to be a part of our life permanently in and among us. Here on the cross, we see God haunting, pervading, submitting to the humility of human pain, not just to share for a moment, but to identify with all time, permanently with our human condition. He invades this condition to the depths, even to the doors of death and beyond. God invades, haunts, both life and death, filling them with a Dominating presence of eternal life. As the psalm says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm with you. Emmanuel, God with us, in all our thirst, even our ultimate suffering and ultimate death. Our thirst. When I read those words, I think back to that gentleman in the hospital or rest home that evening, because that was my father. Those are the last words he ever told me. Everybody had gone out and kind of knew, we knew he wasn't going to last too much long. We didn't know it was a day or a week or something. And I said, well, I got the first shift tonight. And so after everybody had gone home, not too far away, just to be close, it was about 10 o'clock at night, and we were giving him morphine, and I said, I know. I said, Daddy, can I do anything else for you? And he said, water. Well, we get, I did the swabbing thing, and he just laid there peacefully, and I dozed off and on through the night. My wife came and joined me at 3 o'clock in the morning because she couldn't sleep, and we sat there with him, and he dozed and had apnea. And about 7 o'clock in the morning, we said, why don't we open up the windows and turn, the, turn some music on? Well, we did that, and the sun shined through, and all of a sudden, the first hymn was, How Great Thou Art, and he breathed his last. And then the very next hymn was, Onward Christian Soldiers. And I looked at my wife, Deborah, and said, can you believe this? This is the way I want to go, <laughs> in a sense. 
And so I think when we think of thirst, it reminds me of water. And what does water remind us in the Christian faith? Baptism. Baptism. God's heavenly promise. This God who is human, humiliated, haunted, and invaded this world that we're a part of also comes to bring us heaven through the waters of baptism. He's the water of life. For all who are thirsty, he gives life. And for us who are claimed by him in our own baptism, marked with the sign of the cross, sealed by the Holy Spirit, we too have that water to share with all those who go through any type of pain, suffering, any type of uh, just sin that's part of this fallen world. The crucified and risen Lord is the water of life. He's not just some vague emotional presence. He is spirit and life, eternal. And in every aspect of life where people hunger and thirst physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, God in Christ is with us. As we gather as the people of Christ, the body of Christ around word and sacrament, we're always reminded that we too are human. We too seek to live in humility. We too seek to be a part of occupying this world as the presence of Christ. And we have the heavenly gifts that God gives each of us as baptized children to continue his mission, the mission of this one who completed it on the cross of justice, mercy, and love. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Whether it's at this font or a font similar to this, y'all can stand if you'd like as you're able. It's at a font like this where we first hear our faith affirmed and celebrated in the thirsty waters of baptism. And so tonight we confess our faith at this font using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our prayers this evening, the petitions will conclude with, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So, with the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, for those in need, and for all of God's creation. As Pastor Carl reminded us, we thirst for many things. We thirst for water, O oh God. We thirst for water that waters plants, that nourishes your creation, water that feeds and sustains us for our everyday life. We give you thanks for the beauty of your creation and for the beauty of spring that is dawning among us. Bless us that we may be good stewards of your creation. Lord, in your mercy... Hear our prayer. We thirst for love, O oh God. 
We pray that you would continue to empower your church, not just this congregation, St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Mooresville, but your church throughout the world, that in our shared ministry together, walking in the footsteps of your cross, walking in the footsteps of your seven last words, we may be signs, a presence of your love to our neighbors and to the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thirst for peace, especially we thirst for peace in times where war is rampant, where nations are pinned against each other, where selfish greed and desire for power overshadow what it means to live in love with one another. We pray especially this evening for peace in the nations of Ukraine and Russia and for all nations experiencing any kind of conflict. Grant paths of resolution and reconciliation. Grant paths that perpetuate peace and love over hatred and violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thirst for healing and for wholeness, O God. For you are our great physician. You are with all who are sick, with all those who are mourning the death or separation from people that they love. You are with all who are weak in mind, body, and spirit. And so we lift those individuals up to you this evening, knowing that you are with them, those whom we name in our hearts and those whom we name aloud on our lips at this time. Quench their thirst for healing and wholeness. Bring peace to those who are troubled in any way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thirst for assurance, O God. Assurance to know that you are with us, whether at school or at work, in our waking, in our sleeping, in our life, and in our death. We give you thanks for the saints who have gone before us, who have modeled the faith to us, those who taught us the faith that we now proclaim and that we now hear proclaimed. Help us to continue in their steps that we may more faithfully and more lovingly and purely love and trust in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thirst for you, O God. We give you thanks for your unending love for us, a love so perfectly revealed that that love took flesh in Emmanuel, God with us, a love that lived and taught and preached and healed among us, a love that loved us so much that he gave his life for us. Help us, O God to understand, to hear again that love and help us to love like you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, hear these prayers and help us to drink in the good news of your love. That in the midst of a world thirsting and groaning with pains, and with hope of your good news, your promise revealed to come again, that we may live each day in hope and in faith. For we lift these prayers, trusting in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Friends, as you depart to go home this evening, as you get ready to go to bed this night, know that Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is with you and sustains all your thirst. Go in peace.